essentially two things we, we need to do. One thing is we have to make an assumption, we have to make the assumption that Paris's choice is guided by his motivations, or as economists would say, by his preferences. So he doesn't choose Aphrodite because she's the first in the alphabet. He chooses her because it's an expression of his motivations. This is the one thing that we have to do, and then we have to think about you know, the other things that he might have had. We know that from Aphrodite he gets love. So what else would he have received had he chosen differently? Well, on offer was power from Hera and wisdom from Athene. So by making the assumption that, um, by, by reconstructing this choice set and thinking about what else he might have received, and by making the assumption that uh, his choice is an expression of his preferences, we can infer from his choice, his preference, we can say Paris chose Aphrodite because he prefers love over power and wisdom. So what we do is we go from observed choice to an inference about preferences and motivations which are not directly observable. And here you have already at the core um, sort of the, 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 the model economists work on when they you know, deal with em empirical phenomena. So, and in fact, the assumption we have made is already one of the three, if you like, core assumptions the uh, economist makes when he deals with um, applying, the, applying theory to empirical phenomena. So the first assumption is the assumption that we've just seen, that choice is rational and expression of preferences and follows some logical rules of consistency. The second core building block is um, that beliefs are rational in the sense that you, know, you receive some new information and then you update, you change your beliefs in response to the arrival of this new information in some logical way. Um, Today we will talk about, you know, I will show you an example that is basically making use of the first building block and I'll show you an example that is built on the second building block. Uh, what I'm not going to do, uh, but what is relevant, the sort of the third big building block, if you like, of economic theory, are notions of equilibrium, like demand equals supply. So in any case, under these assumptions, uh, what the economist does is he observes not directly observable preferences, or not directly observable beliefs from observed choice. So th these statements that uh, we arrive on, or the interpretations, if you like, that uh, the economist arrives on, it are of this type. For example, you observe that uh, firms have chosen particular prices, and then what you try to do, you try to infer from these chosen prices the cost and demand conditions that the firm faces. And uh, then, you know, this, the firms are said to, hold, to have chosen the prices that the economist observes because they face cost and demand conditions that we have inferred, right? So it is an interpretation of what um, the firm does. And similarly, if uh, we turn to consumers, um, the, the task is we observe, uh, say, working hours and shopping data, and from that we try to infer preferences over consumption and uh, leisure that are again not directly observable and again the consumer is then said to have chosen like he did because of his preferences. So the idea here is um, let's use uh, the same, what we want to do is we want to use the same machinery to understand characters in fiction, drama or today in opera to uncover something about their beliefs and motivations that is not directly observable in the text, libretto or on the stage. And I'm going to do this uh, via two examples. So from the, the large toolkit, if you like, that economic theory provides me with, I will pick uh, two simple instruments and illustrate them with two examples from Richard Wagner's uh, operas. I will do something that I'll call counterfactional analysis that is very much based on the first building block. It's the what if that we already touched on when we talked about uh, you know, Paris making his choice. What if had he chosen differently? And we will apply this to the crucial, the linchpin scene uh, of um, uh, Tannhäuser. And uh, the second example centers around beliefs, um, so it will analyze belief structures uh, in Lohengrin. Green. So example number one, counterfactual analysis. Um, the idea is um, basically, as I said earlier, to understand characters' actions by thinking about what else they might have done and how this would have changed their outcome, their life. How would, you know, things have continued otherwise. So this requires two steps. The first step is we have to reconstruct choice sets. So, you know, in a play, we see a character making a choice, right? And sometimes we know what 
else he might have done because maybe we see him at a crossroads and he can turn left or right and we see him choosing left and we know the alternative would have been to go right. Sometimes it might be less obvious and we might have to work a little harder to uncover, to, to think about what the alternatives would have been for these characters. Now, once we have reconstructed the alternatives that the characters might have taken, we have to think about how the story would have continued had the alternative choices been taken, right? I mean, in, in, a, in, in a play, typically we see somebody, the, the actor, the character goes left, and then we see what happens if he goes left. What we do not see on stage is typically what would have happened had he gone down right. But this is what we have to do, right? This is, this is, this is, this is, the, this is um, uh, the exercise uh, that I'm going to show you now. Um, so when we do this um, with uh, Tannhäuser. So b b before, before I apply this methodology, let me briefly recapitulate the story. So the opera opens, uh, and we see Tannhäuser in Venus's cavern. And uh, it's clear he has spent there quite some time. And uh, he had lots of fun uh, with Venus. So there she is again, Venus, the goddess of love. Uh, but he gets uh, tired, uh, and he wants to go out again uh, to the green fields. And uh, essentially, soon after he leaves, he's, uh, he also wants to reintegrate into you know, normal courtly society, go back to the Wartburg, uh, join his fellow minnesingers. And uh, once there, realizes that he also wants to marry his old love, pure virgin Elizabeth. Um, now, just after he has rekindled his love uh, to Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth's father, the Landgraf, calls a song contest. And the task in the contest is to praise love. And the winner, the Landgraf says, can take whatever he wants. Now, Tannhäuser knows that um, what he would choose, he would choose Elisabeth. But his problem is uh, that also his main rival, Wolfram, uh, would choose Elisabeth. Then the contest starts. Um, we're now in the second half of the second act. And Tannhäuser's rivals start to praise courtly love. And we see Tannhäuser getting ever more nervous and agitated, until finally he can't contain himself and has a very emotional outbreak, where he essentially says, you all don't know what you're talking about. Real love is about passionate sex, and I know it because I have been to Venus's mountain. Now, this is the 13th century, a rather more prudish society. And uh, uh, these all these people, this is a telephone ringing here. Um, uh, you know, all these people, um, you know, they believe in sins, they believe in heaven and hell, right? So what he does here is he confesses to a really grave sin. Um, and um, he confesses to this sin with passion. So you can imagine what happens. Total mayhem breaks out, and uh, they almost lynch him. Right? They almost lynch him, and only an intervention of Elizabeth uh, saves him. And then they basically decide that uh, he, he gets sent off to Rome to seek penance. And the act ends with Tannhäuser accepting uh, that um, sentence very calmly. Now, this is uh, the scene I want to talk about. What do the critics say? Well, the literature, if you look at it, uh, you can basically summarize it and say making, making two big points about uh, that scene. The first is, you know, deals with why would somebody, you know, put his life at risk by making this, you know, stupid confession. And uh, the, the, the answer that the literature gives to this is, well, this is the artist poet um, driven by his passion, not reasons, just can't help himself. Yes, he screws up badly, you know, but this is how artists are. And second, the literature says, well, Wagner didn't write this libretto very well, uh, because, you know, if uh, the guy was so passionate um, in one moment, you know, putting his life at risk for praising Venus, how can he so calmly accept just five minutes later being sent to Rome? There is something, you know, just psychologically not very convincing. So what I want to do is I want to re-examine this scene and, you know, shed a different light on uh, both these points. So you can guess what is coming, we have to think about what Tannhäuser's alternatives would have been, you know, to praising Venus. Um, 
Now, we have reason to believe from uh, what we know about him in the opera that uh, of all the minnesingers, uh, Tannhäuser is the most talented. So, presumably, he could have sung a really good song to win the contest. Or, you know, he could have decided just sing a mediocre song and lose the contest. Right? So that seemed to be, you know, uh, the natural alternatives here for a talented singer once a song contest is underway. And now we have to think about how would, you know, the story have continued had he sung either a really good or a rather mediocre song. Now, it's clear that if he loses, it's not a very desirable outcome for him because then uh, his old friend Wolfram will take uh, Elisabeth's hand and Elisabeth will become Frau von Eschenbach. Now, ironically, winning the contest turns out not to be a good alternative either because if he takes Elisabeth's hand without having been absolved of his sins and he has to go to Rome for that, he would severely aggravate his sins and so this action would put him uh, on a straight path to hell. And again, this is the 13th century. These people do believe in hell, and purgatory has not yet been invented. Uh, so it's either heaven or hell. So what we can see here is that what Tannhäuser does, whether it's premeditated or not, and there's a recent, recent production in Barcelona by Robert Carson where he shows this actually, this outbreak as premeditated. Um, what he does is, in some sense, changing the rules of the game. It's a truly heroic act. It's the act of creative destruction, if you like. Because by sabotaging the contest, he keeps his options open. He can go to Rome, what he had intended when he leaves Venus's cavern anyway, before the Landgraf comes up with the contest. This is what he wants. And he has still a chance to be united with Elizabeth, because once the mayhem breaks out, the fir first prize is never awarded. And indeed, you know, in the th third act, although it's all a little complicated, he does get reunited with Elizabeth, only in heaven, but still. Um, so let's go back to, um, you know, reevaluating Tannhäuser the hero in this scene and Tannhäuser the opera. What this kind of analysis tells us is there's nothing strange or bewildering in Tannhäuser's behavior. Uh, the outbreak uh, solves his problem. And there's also no weakness in Wagner's libretto because he's perfectly calm. He's, he can be perfectly calm because he gets what he wanted previously anyway. And what really, you know, what really creates the drama here is if you look at this conundrum and the way he solves it is that only through praising sin can he achieve, can he achieve salvation. Right? So, so this is what, this is what makes um, uh, the second scene and, and I guess the opera as a whole um, so dramatic. Uh, this was example number one um, about choice and now um, and counterfactuals. So let me now talk a little about beliefs uh, and I turn to Lohengrin for that. Now Lohengrin um, uh, almost uh, very much ask for an analysis of the belief structure because it's an opera that is very much about uncertainty and has uncertainty about others at its very core. Essentially, it's two questions that are um, at the center uh, of Lohengrin. It's the question whether Elsa killed her brother or not and who the knight is who comes to rescue her. But let me again you know, put this in context of the opera story. When the opera opens, we see Elsa uh, being accused of having killed her brother. Um, she's accused by Telramund, uh, who is married to Ortrud. Ortrud comes, uh, doesn't play a role in the first act, but she's important in the second act. We will come to her. Now, the king comes into town and suggests that uh, the matter is solved through an ordeal, um, the ordeal being a battle between two knights where one fights you know, for, the notions of, for the notion of her innocence and one for the notion of her guilt, and where the outcome of uh, the, where God reveals the truth uh, through the outcome of the battle. Okay? That is the idea of an ordeal. Elsa falls into prayer, praying uh, for a knight to appear and uh, then uh, enters Lohengrin. And uh, it's a famous entrance um, drawn by a swan and uh, you know, with very holy music. Um, so for the audience, there's very little doubt that this is uh, the arrival of a true superhero. Lohengrin arrives and um, is willing to fight for Elsa on two conditions. 
uh, condition one is that she marries him. And condition two, that she never asks who he is or where he comes from. Uh, this is in this condition uh, he uh, imposes on the leitmotif you can see uh, on the screen, uh, the very prominent leitmotif that uh, keeps recurring throughout the opera. Elsa accepts these two conditions. The fight begins, uh, Lone Green strikes Telramund down, um, and Elsa's innocence is thus proven to all who believe in God. So that could be a happy ending now. Um, but there is none because in the third and final act, after having been wed to Lone Green, Elsa succumbs to asking the forbidden question and tragedy ensues. He leaves, she dies, there is no redemption whatsoever. It's uh, clearly the bleakest uh, of all Wagner's ending, despite you know, the ending in The Ring where the whole world is destroyed, but in this case there's a glimmer, a glimmer of hope. Here there is none. So why does it go wrong? Why does it go wrong? Now the critics say, because nobody can live without knowing their partner's true identity, meaning their partner's true character, the problem they say, sort of, you know, the uncertainty that I call here first order uncertainty will become clear later why I call it first order, the uncertainty about will he really stay with uh, me forever, right? Um, um, does he really love me? But the question we have to ask is, is this really so bad? And in fact, if we look at the second act, and the second act is sort of Ortrud's act. Remember, Ortrud is uh, Telramund's wife. Um, basically, this, the entire second act, Ortrud uh, spends with trying to instill doubt in uh, Elsa, trying to manipulate her, um, trick her into asking the question to Lohengrin. And essentially, she makes two attempts to do this. And in the first attempt, she comes to um, Elsa and says, you know, um, do you really know who this guy is? Do you really know whether he loves you? And she says, well, maybe the guy will disappear just in the same way as he arrived. Um, but by this, Elsa, it turns out, is not bothered at all. Um, uh, she says to Ortrud, you don't know what love is. Right? So, Neither does this explanation seem you know, very convincing in general, nor seems Elsa particularly bothered when, when she's confronted with this kind of uncertainty. But then Otto changes her strategy and she comes back, and this time she makes a claim about how Lone Green might have won the battle. She says, well, maybe the guy is a wizard. And suddenly things change completely. So the mention, uh, Ortrud's mentioning of wizardry has a very profound effect on, on, on Elsa. And from then on, you know, her you know, faith starts to crumble. Now, what I'm going to show you is why this has an effect. I'm going to show you that it has to do with you know, uncertainty and beliefs, but with higher order beliefs. Higher order beliefs being beliefs about beliefs. This will become clearer you know, when, we see, when we see this in detail. In order to understand that, we have to go back to the battle. Now, if the battle's outcome reveals the th truth through God's will, the battle is essentially a bet, right? She's either guilty or innocent, and one person bets on her guilt and one on the innocent. Now, and this is a bet for, and this is the moment where we, you know, use economic theory, uh, for which economic theory predicts that normally it should not take place. People should not bet. And this follows from a class of uh, celebrated results in, in economic theory that are called agreement theorems. So let me give you a brief introduction into these kind of results. So typically they say there is no betting. And the logic works a little like this. Say, you know, initially you might have different information about which of two outcomes is more likely. Let's say, you know, you bet on the weather. I have another example on betting on the weather, so let's stay with the weather. You know, initially somebody might have seen dark clouds gathering and somebody else might have seen a ray of sunshine. So have different information and so one is willing to bet on sunshine and the other on rain. But suppose you're willing to bet on sunshine and you, you propose the bet and the other person is willing to accept the bet, right? The other person is willing to accept the bet. Then you have to realize that this person must have different information, right? Had this person seen the ray of sunshine, he wouldn't accept the bet. So the willingness to bet contains information that you should take into account. So let me give you, you know, a complete example uh, that is, you know, super stylized 
uh, on a bet on, on tomorrow's weather. So Bob and Nancy consider a bet on tomorrow's weather. The weather can be warm or cold and sunny or cloudy. So there are four types of weather, warm and sunny, warm and cloudy, cold and sunny, or cold and cloudy. Now Bob knows, say, that uh, he knows whether it's going to be warm or cold, while Nancy knows whether it's going to be sunny or cloudy. Now Nancy wins, the, this, the, the bet they consider is that Nancy wins if it's sunny and warm, and Bob wins in all three other cases. So this bet will never take place, and let me explain to you why. So we can do this just in a few steps. Step one, if Nancy knows it's going to be cloudy, right, she will not offer the bet because she knows that she is going to lose the bet. Right? So the second step means that if Nancy offers the bet, Bob can infer that it's going to be sunny because otherwise Nancy wouldn't have offered the bet. But remember, Bob knows whether it's going to be warm or cold. Now he also knows that it's going to be sunny. So already in the second step, Bob knows the precise weather. And this, of course, means that he will only accept the bet if he knows that he's going to win. Now, Nancy can anticipate this, that Bob is go only going to accept the bet if he's going to win, and she will never offer it in the first place. Now, similar chains of reasoning can be constructed for other bets and other information structures in, in this kind of results hold, hold under fairly general circumstances. The logic is always the same. Let us briefly apply the logic again to the battle. Right? If Lohan Green is willing to fight, Tel Ramon should reason he must have information about Elsa's innocence. Of course, Tel Ramon might still want to fight. However, this provides no very strong information to Lohan Green about how certain Tel Ramon is. If Lohan Green is then also still willing to fight, Tel Ramon gets even stronger information about how good Lohan Green's evidence must be, and so on. So you can imagine these people, you know, raising their swords and walking towards each other step by step, and every little step they make an inference like this until one of them gives up. Okay? So I said the, the theorem predicts that normally people won't fight, won't bet. So under which conditions um, do, does the theorem allow agents uh, to bet? So why would anybody actually fight? From the perspective of the theorem, there are exactly two reasons why one person would want to fight. A, you fight because you know the truth for sure. If you know the truth for sure, right, there is nothing you know that you're going to win. And the second reason why you might want to be uh, willing to fight is you don't believe in God. Because if you don't believe in God, you might think that you can win the fight through either strength or indeed wizardry. Now, it turns out that these are the two conditions the theorem allows, the two conditions the theorem says under which somebody might want to fight. And what we find in the opera, that both of them apply to the two characters. Because we learn later in the second act that Tel Ramund has indeed doubts about the existence of God, while Lohan Green, as we learn at the very end, knows the truth for sure. So let's briefly think about who knows what after the fight. Well, clearly Elsa knows she's innocent. Well, she didn't kill her brother. She always knew she's innocent. <coughs> now, Lohan Green knows she's innocent because, you know, he has, he has the knowledge from God himself. Moreover, all God-fearing bystanders know that she's innocent because the truth has been revealed through the ordeal. Also, Ortwood knows she's innocent because, um, as we learn later, um, she has abducted uh, the brother. The only person in the entire cast who doesn't know that Elsa is innocent is poor Telramund because he doesn't believe in God. So you might wonder, if almost everybody knows that Elsa is innocent, what is the problem here? Now the problem uh, I want to argue is that while both Elsa and Lone Green know that she is innocent, Elsa does not know that Lone Green knows that she is innocent. And here we have a higher order belief, a second order belief. It is about Elsa's belief, about what Lone Green believes, about her innocence or guilt. Now why is that? Because without knowing who Lone Green is, she must consider the possibility that Lone Green himself does not believe in God or is a wizard. And he didn't fight because he believed in the truth. He simply fought because he knew as a wizard he would win the fight. Now, and this is, of course, you know, this is what Ortrud manages to play on. So <clears throat> let's think again about Elsa's second order beliefs. She realizes that without knowing Lauren Green's identity, she must believe, her husband may believe, 
that after all she did kill her brother. Now, can she live with somebody whom she suspects of suspecting her of having committed murder? Now, let me, let me put the emotional power that is in such higher order beliefs in a modern day example. Just suppose you are publicly accused of a hit and run having killed a little child. Uh, you know you're innocent, but you have to stand trial. You are cleared, but then you overhear a telephone conversation of your spouse where she or he speaks to a friend uh, saying that um, he or she believes that you might have lied and actually killed the child. Now, the question is, after overhearing this telephone conversation, can you live happily ever afterwards without raising the issue? And probably you can't. But this is exactly what the forbidden question demands from Elsa. The general claim I want to make is that real drama is to be found almost invariably in second or higher order beliefs. First order uncertainties are the, the driving force of genre plots. It's the who done it, it's the how done it, the why done it. While what I believe about what you believe about me can be a source of much deeper anguish and therefore you know, a much better ingredient to make thrilling drama. Let me give you some examples. Let's look at, you know, and all these are popular topics in, you know, the great dramas and operas. Adultery, double dealing, any form of betrayal. Essentially, it's about that I believe that you believe I'm not doing what I'm doing. Or somebody says, you don't trust me. It expresses that I believe that you believe that I cannot be trusted. Guilt. I feel bad because I believe that you believe what I did is wrong. And very similar embarrassment or what makes people blush. It's I believe that you believe what I did was stupid or wrong. Yeah. And you can, these are just second order beliefs. It's just a few examples. Uh, you can go to, uh, you know, think about how more intricate these things become if you add more orders, uh, higher orders of beliefs. So why does Elsa ask the question? Living with uncertainty about how much her partner loves her, Elsa can, right? We have seen that in, in Ortrud's first attempt. It's just not a very credible, it's a lazy interpretation to say this is why she asked the question. But living with the idea that Lorne Green might think that after all she did commit a terrible crime, she finds unbearable. And there is simply no way that Elsa can remove this uncertainty except by asking the forbidden question. Now, having done this analysis, we can also look again at um, uh, how the plot is constructed. And we can really see, you know, the beauty of this plot. Because all the parts interlock. You know, the trial by battle scene, which is a great spectacle in the opera house, yeah, but it's not just a spectacle. It's crucial for the inner logic of the subsequent acts. Moreover, the two big unknowns, Elsa's innocence or guilt and Lone Green's identity, are not just, you know, mirroring the, the, the question of uncertainty. It's not just that uncertainty comes twice. They are inseparably linked through the forbidden question. And it's when they meet that tragedy is inescapable. Essentially, this is, um, this is what I wanted to say, but uh, you might ask, um, well, what about the music? Um, after all, this is about opera. Um, so let me, let me just do two things. Let me tell you about you know, one thing that um, uh, we found in Tannhäuser, if you look at the music. It turns out that when Tannhäuser has his outbreak and praises Venus in the contest, which gets him almost killed, he does so on the same melodic material that he earlier used in the cavern when he declared that he must leave Venus behind. So we have here a clue in the music that almost perfectly mirrors the argument that we made. But, uh, you know, more importantly, uh, I thought, you know, you've come here uh, to a talk um, with opera in the title, so maybe you expected that you could also listen to some music. So I thought, you know, I end this uh, with uh, Kirsten Fluxstadt. Uh, you know, then nothing can go wrong, I thought, if, um, if we have Kirsten Fluxstadt with us. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd play you, um, 
I play you part of uh, her, the, 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 the prayer, the initial prayer, her dream that uh, gets so cruelly shattered. Madam Kirsten Flagstad. Madam Flagstad salutes the Salvation Army as she sings Elsa's dream of her noble knight Lohengrin, custodian of the Holy Grail. The San Francisco Opera Orchestra is under the baton of its general director, Maestro Gaetano Merola. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 